Welcome back to Black News, y'all. This is a program presented by the Chicago West Community Music Center. Tonight, we have famed actor Harry Lennox. He's going to chop it up about his hit series, Blacklist, and go way back to when we first met him as one of the heartbeats in the five heartbeats. So let's just get started, y'all, with Harry Lennox. So how are you doing with this pandemic? What's happening with that? How are you? How are y'all doing? Well, I'm doing well. Thank you, Clarence. It's great to be with you today on Black News. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hanging in. You know, we're back at work on the show. We've been back since October. I'm actually starting some work on a show called Billions, which is a terrific show on Showtime. Um, I'll go in next week. And uh, so things are moving, you know, for me. Uh, they got, obviously, during the pandemic, at first, nobody knew quite what to do, but uh, you know, people are back uh, filming. Uh, things seem to be getting back to normal with the vaccine and that. So you know, that was a hard time, but uh, but we're coming out of it. Yeah, yeah. So was your show Black? Is this your ninth season on on the air? Well, almost. We're uh, we're about three quarters or so of the way through season eight, but we know okay. that there will be a season nine. There will be. Okay. What's the key? What is it about it that everybody tunes in, including me? Although it, it did not come on last night, I was disappointed. Uh, I thought it did come on. No, it didn't, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was. It had Dateline, was it on instead, whatever. But anyway, huh. what's the appeal of the show? Uh, other, other than me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. No, listen, I, <laughs> as I've always said, I think uh, I think we got. A perfect uh, trifecta of action and intrigue, and I think we have some excellent acting, and I and I and that's led by James Spader, who's a tremendous actor. Megan Boone does a great job as Elizabeth Keene. So you know that's a it's an inherently interesting story, uh, the relationship between those two leading figures. Uh, I think that's that's the first source of it, and then you know the writers do a terrific job of spinning the web. And, uh, you know, they keep opening up rabbit holes and people like going down them. So as long as that remains the case, you know, we might have a show on our hands. Okay. All right. <laughs> so now let's move to Chicago, to the south side of Chicago, to the art center that you're building. Tell me about that, all that you can tell me about that. Well, you know, it's something like the uh, a concrete version of a dream of some sort, you know, really it's, it's um, I, I was overwhelmed with art and culture growing up on the south side of Chicago. Uh, on my block were musicians. We had Cleve Eaton, Cleveon Eaton, uh, the great bass player for people like Ramsey Lewis, and great inspiration, tremendous, tremendous bass player. But he lived on the next, on the other side of the alley. We went to play with daycare or something, or, or summer camp with the Record family, who Eugene Record. And, the, and those guys started the Shy Lights. Um, I was in band. Uh, you could go, there were four or five jazz clubs in the neighborhood. You could go hear the blues, you heard it. You know, you would hear people playing, you know, you'd walk down the street. And then sometime, I don't know what it was, maybe the, I think really the mid seventies, late seventies, and certainly throughout the eighties, institutions just started going away. Uh, uh, to some extent, even the 90s, there was a place called The Other Place, which was live jazz seven nights a week, the apartment lounge, you know, these places, I guess the owners died or moved along and, and then the culture went with them. And I think one of the problems, Clarence, is that we don't really build institutions in Black America, in Chicago, as well as we do personality and celebrity. We're, we're pretty good at that. But in terms of 
propagating an idea and ensuring that it goes on in perpetuity. These is, that's what institutions do. And I think that people have built, uh, built to some extent cults of personality places. But you know, as, as those buildings aged and as the people who led the organizations aged, died out, uh, as the eye got taken off the ball and was put into things like politics and just day-to-day -day survival, and finance and that sort of thing, then, then we lost the art. And that's the sad thing because I believe the art itself is the coping mechanism that Black America invented, really, uh, at least in a unique way here, uh, to get through those times. And I think that we, we, we got suckered by some extent by some of my very favorite uh, politicians. Chicago's a very political town, but we started thinking that it was about that. And it was about uh, votes and things of this nature. So all of which I guess is important. But in reality, the, the sustaining element of black life has been our culture. And that's been in a form of faith at least is practiced uh, in houses of worship, great music, great dance, great uh, homiletics, these kinds of things have helped us get through and really was the perfect solution in many ways. And that we forgot that or it got seduced away from it. And so I'm trying to restore that and to give it a home where arts organizations don't really have to think about, well, how do we pay the light bill or how do we, uh, who do we get to cut the lawn? Well, that would be managed by a, by a real estate management company, a campus manager, so to speak, just like Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. Lincoln Center, you know, was built, uh, or at least opened up or whatever in 1969, I think. And it was a central home for already existing institutions such as American Ballet Theater, uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center, New York Philharmonic, Metropolitan Opera, so forth. And they, and they gave them a home, already existing places, gave them a home and managed that physical plant for them. And today they do, before COVID at least, they do some 3,000 or so events per year. At the Lincoln Center, to say nothing at Carnegie Hall, which probably does, you know, something ridiculously um, prolific like that. Where is that on the south side of Chicago? Where is it in Black America at all, really? Right. Certainly on the south side of Chicago, we have a unique duty, I think, to provide it. And, and, uh, and if not me, then who? Uh, and if not me and a team of people, like-minded individuals, certainly not my idea, but, uh, but the idea that we can bring these companies, these itinerant companies that have no place, uh, I, I think it's un unforgivable, inexcusable that you have to go downtown or on the north side or something to see you know, great black art. That's, that's, not, uh, that's not okay. And so I'm trying to fix it. Okay, so now where is it located? Is it on Cottage Grove, I think it is or something? That's right. The, the Lily and Marcy Center for the Performing Arts will be at 44th and Cottage Grove, um, uh, you know, right there in Bronzeville where a lot of that art was born. Okay, now isn't it named after your mother or a mentor? Tell me about that. Actually, both. Very good. Uh, yeah, my mother Lillian, uh, Lillian Cleo Lennox, and then uh, Mrs. Marcella. Uh, her nickname was Marcy Gilly, who was a principal at Bass Elementary School. Now I think a magnet school in Inglewood. But uh, these two ladies really exemplified through their lives. Uh, they were kind of living culture books, you know, teachers, educators, uh, uh, patrons of the art, matrons in this case of the art, uh, people who knew how to teach, how to pass that uh, legacy down and, uh, and profound and lasting ways. And so I thought it might be nice to do this in their honor. Yeah. So when might it open or what stage are you with the planning of it all? Well, this thing has been cooking for a few years already, uh, but the, it can be complicated trying to get through, you know, requirements for raising the money to uh, putting it on the map to drawing up the plans, viability, uh, uh, impact studies, all of these things have to be done ahead of time. I think probably it'll be good that that was all done, but we hope to get underway building it at the third quarter of this year, so another six months.
we hope to uh, start building this out, the Lily and Marcy Center. Uh, and then hopefully to open about a year after that. So in the fall of 2022, uh, okay. that's the plan, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So now you're from Chicago, the South Side. Did you say w w what street you're on you, when you're located? I mean, you grew up on, what was it? Yep, so I grew up on a not too terribly well-known street called Phillips. It's one block east of Yates, which is a, a, a boulevard. And so a little bit bigger and a little bit more of a thoroughfare, such as it is, Yates. Uh, about a mile east of Jeffrey, which everybody probably knows. About uh, two miles, I guess, from Stony Island, you know, and so, and so on, going west. But pretty close to the lake, about a mile east, uh, about a mile west of the lake and uh, uh, close to 79th Street. So 77 and Phillips is where I grew up. Got it, got it. All right, and you went to school in Northwestern. Now, I assume that you majored in theater, or was that, is that correct? There was no theater major, you know, we, uh, at the time, I don't, I don't think there is now, but there, but we got our degree in speech, and uh, at that time, and now called communication. So if I uh, graduated today, I'd have a bachelor of probably in science and communications. And um, so I never got a BA, I didn't get an MA, uh, but I, I, I studied uh, with some excellent uh, teachers and other actors, you know, at the time. So there was a, um, a department of theater in the School of Communications. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Now, you were a school teacher. Name the school that you taught it, I never knew that. So where I met Mrs. Gilly, Marcy Gilly, was at Bass Elementary School. It's on 66 in uh, Racine, um, right across from Ogden Park. Actually, pretty pretty well known park over there. So, Bass Elementary School. Okay, all right. Now, did you did you teach theater, or what were you teaching at that? Point? <laughs> well, I, I guess I well, taught theater by demonstrating it. You know, <laughs> uh, acting. Uh, I had to act every day, you know, at school. That's how it is. Uh, you have to act. Mrs. Gilly taught me this. She's that, you know, she was my principal at Bass. Um, also taught a, a couple of uh, days with my sister Lori at Doolittle East School. But you would have to pretend to be angry when you weren't, or pretend not to be angry when you were. <laughs> you pretend to be proud when you were not, or not to be proud when you were. So, um, but no, I taught. I guess the, the most a consistent subject I taught was music. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Now, you also wanted to be a priest. What was that about at that young age? And, and you want to be maybe the first Black Pope? Whatever. Tell me about that. Well, you can say I'm, I'm wearing my priestly, uh, <laughs> almost pre quasi priestly garb here. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Clarence. I, my, my father died when I was not quite two years old. I think uh, I might have been three months shy of my second birthday. And my father, who I don't remember, I have no memory of, uh, passed away, had cancer, Hodgkin's disease. Um, and so I didn't know, I didn't have any kind of reference for father except for these men and the collars that were walking around in the school where I went to. And we called them father. And uh, we called the ladies and their habits, we called them sisters and so forth. But, uh, but I thought, well, you know, I didn't have a father. I turned out all right. And when, uh, even as a young boy, I was like, I'm turning out all right. It would be great to be one of these men uh, who we call father, you know, people who weren't married and didn't have their own children, but sort of were uh, surrogate fathers to a lot of uh, similar people. Uh, for me, who represented a kind of order and sense of uh, de duty, and dedication. Uh, that was my experience with them. I was an older boy, so, you know, I was deeply moved by the ritual of the church, by the rituals, uh, from confirmation to uh, reconciliation to communion. All of these were deeply fascinating uh, events for me, these sacraments. And, and so it's really hard to sort of not get taught, caught up in the... <laughs> Immersion. I went to school at the church at the school that was part of the church, St. Bride Elementary School and Church. Um, I was in, you know, mass a couple of times a week at least. If I had to do a service as an older boy, uh, many times a week. 
And uh, my brother had been an older boy before me. And so, yeah, you know, I thought, well, if you're going to, if you're going to live a life that's of service and dedication and scholarship and all of these things, this would be a good way to do it. And I, and I uh, was serious about it until I, I was taken off of the path by, by my mind being opened. There's a possibility of doing something else. And that was the acting thing. And, uh, but I didn't really start taking that seriously until I got to Northwestern uh, at about the age of 18, when I realized that, you know, hey, uh, I might have a, a gift here. You know, I might have some talent that can get me a career even. I started working as a professional actor while I was at Northwestern. Uh, so I've been a professional now, I guess about 37 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's very interesting. It's, uh, so I, I was sort of taken away from it by curiosity, by uh, proclivity. You know, I, I knew I could do it well, uh, relative to, it's really relative to uh, people my age. And so I wanted to, uh, to pursue it and to, and to see what lay there. And I never really got back to the, to the path. There's a beautiful poem by Robert Frost called uh, The Road Not Taken. And it says, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Uh, oh, I saved the first for another day. But knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever turn back. You know, so, so there you go. So, I mean, that was sort of a, 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 a I paraphrase there, but this, this idea that I always intended to come back, but just never did. Okay. Now, all right. You know, you remind me, even me, of somebody, somebody famous, someone that we all know. And that is Barack Obama. I hear it when you speak. I hear it now in this conversation. I never, I don't hear it on TV or any of your movie roles, but the real you has a something. Well, is that true? Let me stop. Is that true? <laughs> I mean, I, although you can answer if that's, you know, I, I, I hear that a lot. If I had a, I guess if I had a nickel, I could, uh, for it every time I've heard it, I could probably have paid for the center by now. <laughs> I could probably have built it. But, uh, you know, I, I knew Barack many, uh, um, Many years ago, and uh, but you know, in all honesty, and I tell people this, uh, I think he reminds you of me, because <laughs> I was I was in the five heartbeats before anybody knew who the guy was. So I I have my own theories. But. <laughs> <laughs> right now, your personal papers are housed at the at Boston University, where Martin Luther King's papers are held. How did that come about? It seemed like quite an honor. It is quite an honor. I, I, I don't know exactly how it came about, but I, I know that Andrew Friedman, our mutual friend, was part of that process. Uh, Boston University has a wonderful archive. So they've, uh, they've got so many great people, friends of mine, even my, my buddy Alan Cumming, I think his archives are there, some other actors, great actors. But uh, the, the person who actually asked me was, her name is Vita Palladino. She was uh, just recently retired. Vita is wonderful. And she reached out, oh, I guess, six years ago or so now. And they asked for, you know, my archives. And I was, of course, shocked. I didn't know why anybody would be terribly interested in them. But uh, but they were and considered to be somebody of, of, uh, of note that they, that they wanted to do this with. And so they've been wonderful. I've been up and given some speeches at the Howard Gottlieb uh, speech. He was their archivist. And um, I think that the, the center is named after him, the archive. So that I did about uh, four years ago on Martin Luther King's birthday with some other distinguished people. So it was, you know, great. And um, that's how it came about. I, I, I've uh, developed quite a, a fond relationship with the Boston University. Okay. All right. I mean, you're doing a little bit of everything. Because now you're also involved with this prostate cancer awareness. Right. Why is that? And what do you think Black men should know about prostate cancer? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked about this, Clarence. You know, Black men are, are disproportionately affected by it and yeah. have a much higher rate of, of dying from it 
but we know that whatever those outcomes are, that they are preventable. And so I want black men in particular, it's a sensitive area of the body as we age, you know, the prostate becomes enlarged. Uh, we are, as I say, as, uh, as a demographic unduly affected by it, but all men have to be conscious about it and conscientious of dealing with it. But early treatment uh, is, is almost impervious to failure. You know, like the, the recovery rates are fantastic if you catch it early. And so every year we simply ask, you know, if, if you're in, a, in the traditional population, if you know you have a history of it, uh, maybe more than once a year, but every year get a PSA, a prostate uh, specific antigen test. Uh, it's, it's really not nearly as intrusive and bad as people uh, make it out to be, but it's, it can save your life. And so we want uh, people to know that there is help out there, that uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a death sentence in any way, and, uh, and that you can actually uh, go about having a pretty full and great life if, uh, if you just do that thing once a year, which you should do anyway. Of course, go and talk to your doctor about it, so forth, yeah. Why lose more people then we have to, you know what I mean? What, if it's preventable, as, as they used to say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, and we know we can, we can do something about this. Yeah, all right. Let's go back to the five heartbeats. So when, when you auditioned for that, were you teaching school or, so did you do that during your lunch hour or something like that? You <laughs> I remember that, <laughs> go ahead. You must, have, you must have been asking around. So. Uh, that was a curious day. I went down, I took a half day from school. So uh, I guess I left before I had my lunch. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I ate something later on that day, but uh, I went down and met with Robert Townsend and the casting director, whose name was Shemin Bernard. I believe she's a Chicagoan, born in Chicago. And uh, we didn't, I didn't wind up auditioning. I just had a conversation with Robert and he found out during that conversation that I was a school teacher and he was, he was, really quite intrigued by this idea. And I was like, oh man, you teach school? I said, yeah, but you know, I act uh, as well. I, I'm, I, I do a play after school is over. I take a bus and a train. <laughs> I think I might've had a car by that point, but uh, you know, I would take a train uh, two hours each way from my apartment in, in, in Uptown down to the South side to teach, take the train back to, uh, uptown do a play at one point i was doing two plays um and then teaching at the same time and developed an ulcer and uh, i was just really really overworked and exhausted uh, but yeah that was that was the life i didn't have any other way really of paying the bills i guess i could have waited tables but teaching seemed to me uh, a more flexible <laughs> to some extent and, and more and more useful and helpful thing to do in terms of instilling the kids in the neighborhood with some kind of, you know, uh, education, information that might be useful to them. So now, do people still recognize you from the Five Heartbeats? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I tell people this all the time, Clarence, that, you know, my uh, career uh, has been long at this point. But I know if I'm in a black neighborhood or black city or white city or white neighborhood, or how old somebody is, uh, mm -hmm. what demographic they'll fall into by the project that they associate me with. <laughs> so if you're black, <laughs> nine times out of ten, it's going to be the five heartbeats. Uh, if you're if you're white, nine times out of ten, it's going to be the blacklist. If you're young, I might hear some stuff like. Justice League or uh, The Matrix or something, you know, I, the young boys will say that. If it's a young girl, <laughs> they might say <laughs> Dollhouse or even something like Insecure. You know, these young women watch this show. I, I play Lawrence's dad on Insecure. So I always know, <laughs> I always could tell why people target market to certain people because I'll be damned if, if they don't fall right into the, to the trap. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, I worked with you and Andrew on the uh, revival. Yeah. That was a great, great, great concept. Are you going to do more with that or do something similar or follow up? What, what might happen with that revival project? 
Yeah, well, we uh, thank you, by the way, for uh, for thinking that it was worthy. And, was, uh, you know, yeah, I'm glad you, you think so. I think that there is a wealth of material um, in, the, in Scripture in general, Old and New Testament, that we can mine for spiritual gold in many ways. But I also think the revival can be in many forms. That it will, it's the greatest story ever told. I think we could do it live. I think that, uh, you know, the movie will eventually be part of everybody's Easter, you know, that every Easter, just like people watch the Ten Commandments, that there will be people who watch revival um, and get to see a really fun, really cool Jesus who, you know, uh, who can compete with any other version uh, on film and on stage eventually. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. I'll always be excited about it, but I also want to do other things. You know, my next goal is to do the Book of Ruth and set that in New Orleans about a hundred years ago after that pandemic. It's a, you know, the, those, those two pandemics are quite interesting. So, um, but I want to do the Book of Ruth uh, set in New Orleans and uh, that will be a musical as well. But I think, you know, there's so many, Samson and Delilah would be amazing. So Cain and Abel, there's a, so we want, you know, my friend, my partners, uh, I have uh, two or three of note. One is most notable is Holly Carter, Dr. Yes. Holly Carter, who's a, a genius. And um, ever since she was at USC, we've been working together on this idea of taking ministry outside of the traditional boundaries of a church, what she calls ministry without walls. And her idea is to merge the faith community with the entertainment community and to bring uh, those two things together so that the word can really get out there. Uh, and, and I think that this is um, a divinely inspired idea. You know, Jesus in the Great Commission, we talk about the Great Commission, he says, uh, go ye into the world and preach this message, you know, and uh, we have the ability to do that now electronically. Uh, they did it on foot. You know, I, I marvel at what the early evangelists were able to do by using the Roman road system, they took uh, a system that was designed to subjugate them really militarily, keep them boxed in. But that system, that road system had never been done. Christianity would have gotten not very far. <laughs> and so some of that was used for their uh, subjugation was actually eventually used to make this the most powerful force that humanity has ever known. And I think that we can do that by using this entertainment industry as well. Uh, we need it more than ever, that is to say, uh, to get back to the spiritual um, interest, concentration, focus, you know, that has, we, we in particular as a people, as the most religious group of people in the world, have used for 400 years in this experience or so, uh, to, to move us uh, to this point and to abandon it seems to me folly. And we want to make sure that it is available so that people don't have to abandon. Cool, cool. Let's go to you and Broadway. You made your debut in August Wilson's The Radio Call. What kind of experience was that? And when was that? What year was that? Radio Golf was 2007. Okay. Uh, yep. I. You know, I was privileged to be taking August Wilson's last play, the play he was working on when he when he left us, uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, and to play the central uh, role in that on Broadway and even before Broadway, I, I had the opportunity to do it at the McCarter uh, Theater in in New Jersey at Princeton. Great experience. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with, uh, with some tremendous actors like the great Anthony Chisholm who we just lost a few months ago, not to COVID, but, but, but uh, you know, a dedicated actor who I believe did the most productions of August Wilson ever. I, I think I could pretty easily prove that. Um, John Jelks, who's a Chicago actor, uh, at least that's where he got his, his big start, been in a few Broadway shows. Uh, John Jelks, Tanya Pinkins, who's from Chicago, uh, and a guy by the name of James Williams, from Minnesota, that was the cast. And, you know, we had all worked with August Wilson during his life in some form or another. Kenny Leon, who, uh, who directed it, so it was really, you know, it was it was an honor. It was uh, like doing homage uh, to 
a man that I had the opportunity to work with directly in the room, August, uh, the greatest playwright of the 20th century, certainly easily American uh, playwright. And so I was, you know, humbled by it. I, I was privileged to do it. And, uh, and especially so because I had it on good confidence that he wrote that part with me in mind. You know, this actor, uh, this character who's, who's about to run for the mayorality of Pittsburgh it would be the first black mayor. That's the, the, the basic subject of the, the play. And then of course he's confronted with his own family history, which had been denied him until he meets old Joe Barlow. Uh, you know, as, there, as he's running for mayor, he wants to develop uh, his neighborhood, put some stuff there, renovate it, so to speak, upgrade it. And he finds out that there's a legacy home that he will have to destroy or, or at least displace in order to do it. And that that home is in itself the treasure, it's the bounty. It's the, it's the entire history collected and represented by this house. Uh, and so he also finds out that he's related to old Joe Barlow. And that they had been kept apart from the, you know, from the, the vagaries of family politics, so to speak. So it's a beautiful story and, and, uh, and I loved it. And um, ever so, uh, it will be one of the highlights of my career that the first and to this point, only time I've been on Broadway was, was to do August's last play. Amazing, amazing, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. So what do you like most? I mean, you've done TV, you've done the movies, you've done theater, you've done Broadway, the top of theater. What do you prefer? Well, I guess I prefer good work, you know? Uh, so if it's something that I can really dig into, I don't care what the medium is. That medium could be um, film, it could be uh, television. That's, you know, more and more these days, television is really where you get to, to dig in your heels and, and do long form storytelling, develop a character, develop a story over the course of, uh, of many seasons now. Um, but there's something about the relaxed in terms of the process being more sort of intense and more relaxed doing film. You know, you, you, you don't have to, it's not as much of a grind. You're not against the clock as much as you're on television. And then of course doing uh, theater, it's a little bit difficult because you, know, you have to do the same thing eight times a week. You're just doing this thing over and over again. And so I think, you know, for me, it depends on what the value of the story being told is, not so much what medium it's being told in. Got it, got it. Where's home? Are you New York or LA? Well, I mean, home will always be uh, Chicago. But I think, uh, but I'm living now in in, uh, in New York, you know, most of the year. It's about 10 months out of the year. But my house, <laughs> where I pay a mortgage, is in Los Angeles. So I, to some extent, you know, I have loyalty to all three places. I have love for all three places. But home will always be Chicago. All right. All right. So I'm all done. Is there anything else that you want to share while we got you? This time went by so quickly. It went by so quickly. Gee whiz. <laughs> But anything else on your mind today? No, I think we covered a, a great swath there, Clarence. I think, you know, I talked about the Lilly and Mercy Center, uh, Blacklist. But yeah, I mean, we did a good, I thought we did a pretty comprehensive job, my friend. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All righty. Yeah. Good enough. All righty. All right. Thanks, Clarence. <laughs>